Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Gulfstream today. Ron Nicoletti along with Ashley Mayu. And we have a beautiful day here on Memorial Day. The main track is fast. The turf course is firm. It looks like it's going to be a pretty nice day, Ashley. And uh, a special day that we have to really pay homage to these uh, people that made the ultimate sacrifice to keep us safe. Yeah, Memorial Day is kind of a, a bittersweet thing in a lot of ways because people gave up so many things for our country, but it's a good day to honor them. Yeah, it's a good day to honor them. And, uh, you know, we do our best to uh, help you out with maybe a little horse racing today and uh, take your mind off uh, all those bad things and think only good thoughts this afternoon. And we've got a fast-made track and a firm turf course to do that $150,000 jackpot guarantee in the Rainbow Six a little later on. I didn't know, we, uh, you had the day off yesterday, but I know you were watching when they bet over $1 million in the late pick five. Yeah, I know there was the carryover. It was funny. My dad called me yesterday. He goes, the pick five paid less the other day. I said, that's because no one hit it. Yeah. And then to see the money, I was yeah. watching the pool totals grow. And I know Pete Aiello tweeted out, it'll be over 500000 It was a lot more than that. <laughs> I, I had guessed on the year but about five, six, seven hundred thousand, and I And I actually gave up at the end. I said, I don't know what it can be. So I, I sort of saved myself at the end. So as you said, we're starting the day with a fast main track firm turf course. We're on a dirt for the first. It's a mile maiden claimer for fillies and mares, three-year-olds, and up $12,500. Not a lot of scratches on the card. I think three altogether. So we'll see how that plays out. And uh, I know you have an early pick five ticket, and I got a feeling you're going to start the day on a winning note. Now some days I got to change this, too. I thought you were going to say <laughs> you knew it was going to be $36, no. which you would have been right. Uh, went too deep here in the opener. I used the morning line favorite, the number one silver package, as well as the number six Lovin, Livin, I thought these were the logical two in here, but I did spread deep in the next two races. I went three deep in each of them. The race two is a five furlong turf event. I thought there were a lot of directions to go. I used Fast Catalina, the number four Yellen, as well as the number eight Happy Loudon. I have an interesting trainer stat we're going to show in a little bit for Amador Sanchez. Race three, I also go three deep in here. It's a mile, a dirt event. I used, again, I think, what are the three logicals? And then in race four and race five, I go two deep in each of those. Race four, I'm really looking forward to. It's the maiden special weight event going seven and a half furlongs over the turf. Really have an interest in one of the fillies in there. Um, we'll talk a little bit about the pedigree. I don't want to spoil things just <laughs> yet. And then race five, again, I go two deep in there. I use Tellington, who's two for two in his career so far, as well as the number eight Thorn. So 36 bucks for me. $36. And with that, that we will get into this first race. And you're right. I think you're absolutely right with the two logical horses in here. I went with the one and so did you, Silver Package, who's dropping to the 12-5 level, stretching out to the mile after responding last time to the surface switch with an improved fourth place finish against those 16 maidens going three quarters of a mile for Ralph Nix leading jock Edgar Zayas I mean it, it, this is a, a, a wide open affair but if you go through the handicap and this one looks like the one to beat. Yeah especially when you look at her two year old races all the ones that were on the dirt she finished second in all of them she was against tougher competition than she's facing today and it seems since the time off she hasn't been up to the same level we didn't see her between September and April but we did see an improved performance last time getting back on the dirt so now I I think just a little bit of a reduction in class should help her find herself a break in her maiden today. And the number six, Lovin' Livin', is another stretching out to the one-turn mile today on the dirt after hitting the board in one of three dirt sprints at the $20,000 level. It's a thought of race day, so certainly bred to handle uh, this mile distance and beyond. So, uh, I, you know, going back, and I just thought these were the logical uh, two in the race. You can make a case for your three horse in here or the eight, uh, We Bless Luck, who you have a little further down, who slides down to this level hasn't been seen since February. Yeah, I think after you look at the top two that we use in the same order, there's a lot of directions you could go to. I went with a long shot just knowing this sort of level. 12-5 maidens can be unpredictable. And I went with the number three, Viva, who she hasn't shown much in her two career starts, but they are both on the turf. She's had some flashy drills since coming here to Gulfstream Park. You see those two works. She had a bullet drill, 36 flat, and before that, 34-4. and four. So I'm just curious to see what we'll see out of her today. Yeah, good uh, spot there with the, uh, you know, good works on the dirt. And, and basically Basically, a first-time starter on the dirt. So for, we'll, we'll cross those through those two dirt uh, gr grass races and say she's a first-time starter. <laughs> Let's go to race number two, Mile Claiming Phillies. Three-year-olds and four-year-olds and up who've never won two in life, $25,000. Uh, you went with the number two horse on top of your ticket, or four horse on top of your ticket, excuse me. So did, I had the four, two, I thought, but oh, in the wrong race. That is it. I flipped the page. <laughs> excuse me. I do have the number two on top of my ticket, Fast Catalina. You went with Yellen. 
Yeah, Yellen won last time out. She had a bit of a freshening, and she just, I thought, had a big performance last time out to win by a length and a half. She was much the best. She finally picked up her first local win here. And before that, she'd kind of been racing at that same level. Sometimes she was in for the 20 tag or 16. And for her, I think the, the concern with her is a consistency angle. But so far, I think in 2021, she's been pretty good so far. Yeah, you're trained by Cam Gamaletti, written today by Edwin Gonzalez, uh, who's having a good meet for this. Uh, you know, we got our two top two flip-flop. I did go with the with two fast Catalina, who's dropped to the 12-5 level after hitting the board in one of two recent, uh, one of three recent turf sprints against 20 down to 16 uh, level courses. Antonio Sano got the apprentice, Gadiel Martinez in the saddle. Horse I might have missed, and I, I'm saying that, you have in third, the eight, Happy London. When I saw the stat that you put out, I, I said, maybe I should have used this horse on my ticket. Yeah, we'll take a look at this trainer stat real quick. Wanted to look at turf sprints the past two years for Amador Sanchez. He wins at 20%. He's 13 for 67 which is pretty strong, 30 for 66 in the money, so just under 50% at 45%. And then the ROI was enticing, $3.43. And when you look at this filly specifically, she's just had one race as a four-year-old, and there's not much to take away from it. Fast Catalina, who's your top selection, uh, beat her on that occasion when she finished second. But I just thought going back two back, I know it was a while back, that was a pretty quick race from her. She was on the front end. She had early foot on that occasion, had a huge buyer speed figure, which is a lot better than other horses that have run recently. And I just, I'm curious to see what she'll do now, second time off the long layoff. Well, you always like those long trots, especially <laughs> in those races that are wide open. So let's go to race number three. It's a mile claimer for fillies. Three or four-year-olds and up non-winners of two in life, $25,000. This is the race I was trying to get to even before we did the second. I was uh, excited about it. You have the two horse in here. And that is Addie Lynn, who goes to the Peter Walder Barn today after the claim. I just thought, first off the claim, this is a horse you have to consider. Now she's going to stretch out back to a mile, which she's really not proven at. She's 0 for 6, but the connections, they do well. I, I like the workout that we saw from her since joining the barn. I just think 8 to 5 on her, honestly, is short when you look at some of the other runners in here. And look at her at Gulfstream Park. I mean, her record, she, she has been able to get the second lifetime win for a while. But last time out, it was an improved performance from what we had seen in her previous three, which are, were against much tougher competition. Well, the number four, 10 pin alley is dropping to the 25 level, uh, you know, level today after following a sharp $20,000 claiming victory, which I wanted to show. Now, this is two starts back. It was a really nice performance. And you're going to see, we're going to pick it up from the top of the stretch when this one has to just, you'll see right there, the number five, 10 pin alley. It has to sort of like steady very, very little right here. You'll just see it right now. Just got to, you know, duck in, but finds that seam along the inside and draws off to win it rather impressive. Uh, trained by Kathy Ridfo. And in the next start, they just stepped it up to the $75,000 optional claiming level, which I was a little, I thought was a little tough. So I like the way this horse ran in that race. Luca Panici in the saddle today. So there you see it. And this is the level where this horse will run today. Yeah, she got bumped pretty good, I would think, when you saw her kind of shift yeah. her position to the inside, but to finish like that was pretty impressive. And, and you mentioned last time out, was just kind of outclassed in that spot. She was trying to close from off the pace. The opening quarter, I think they walked in 25, <laughs> so that wasn't going to help her. But her race is here. Other than that, they've been quite strong. You can see those three before that. They've all been good performances. Um, she's faced, you know, a couple, one of the runners that's in here today, I think has the, the sixth the six post position today. Uh, but another thing I want to pull up here was a trainer stop for Kathy Ritvo specifically doing some more digging on her numbers and I just want to look up second off the layoff. I know the form usually tells you 45 to 180. I want to look to 45 to 90, more specific for this horse the past three years. Nine for 31 in terms of wins, 61% in the money with a $2.91 ROI. So Kathy does tremendous work getting these horses to run second off the layoff. I like that stat. So that <laughs> uh, makes my top pick even look a little better today after that performance. Yeah, it just might have been a little too tough last time out. We both had some interest in here in the number three, Siren's Lucky Song, who's uh, stretching out to a mile today after responding in the first race after the claim by Bobby DeBona with a duel for the lead victory against those 25 maidens going six and a half. Edgard's going to ride today looking at Lucky, certainly who's bred to respond favorably to this mile distance. Yeah, the mile distance, I think, will be, you know, the pedigree suggests it. We'll have to see from her. Last time out, she had to battle it throughout the race, and she was able to prevail at the six and a half furlong distance. I just thought some of these other horses, they've been in deep waters or faced winners already, and that's why I gave them the slight edge over her. But there's no reason that she can't perform well facing winners for the first time. I mean, the barn does okay with horses that won last time out at 14%, but at the meet, 
they've been doing really great work. Well, let's go to race number four, one of the very interesting races on the card. It's about seven and a half furlongs on the turf, made in special weight, fillies and mares, three-year-olds and up with seven in the field. As I mentioned at the top, not a lot of scratches this afternoon. A and vintage style is both where we start. It's a full sister to a, a group one winner called Capazano. Wheels back was a good second last time out. I liked the performance last time out. I think the horse was, you know, not really looked at, went off at about 11 to 1, but was able to make ground up there, sat mid-pack early on and got a nice trip from Paco. Edgar Zaya is climbing aboard, who wins at 40% with George Weaver. I think the numbers there all around are there for this filly, but we both look at the horse to the outside for a lot of reasons, the big one being the pedigree. Yeah, and check out the uh, this last, uh, Vintage Styles last race up near the popcorn stand, this horse <laughs> turning for home. So we're going to pick that one up right now. And there you see, and that is the number five that afternoon in vintage style you know just coming from home trying to get that spot gets pushed out a little bit so closes i'm going to go one two three four five six wide i think coming into the stretch and as you mentioned good connections uh, you know george weaver with edgar zayas is a hundred and fifty thousand dollar daughter of bernardini and she ran well i mean i thought she had a, a tough trip and she ran well i'm expecting improvement in there but as i uh, sort of uh, tipped at the top there's a couple of nicely bred horses in this race or one for sure. Yeah, the number seven romanticized. That's who we go to next. And I think the reason is this is a full sibling to Exaggerator, which I know we <laughs> talked about the other day. You start looking at horses and you forget all the things they've accomplished. He accomplished a lot during his racing career. Yeah, I mean, he won the Preakness Stakes. Of course, I remember that. This one is a $500,000 daughter of Curlin. So one of my favorite horses that ran on the racetrack, as you mentioned, won the Preakness. It's debut for Safi and Edwin Gonzalez named to ride. I think you watch the tote. Maybe it'll give us a, a tip how good this horse can be. Breeding says it should be very good. Yeah, I think the big question, we'll have to see the turf side of it, because I know we both looked, Exaggerator was a dirt <laughs> horse. He won from six to nine and a half furlongs, but not a lot of turf there. But, I mean, the barn does tremendous work with first-time starters, and I like seeing Edwin Gonzalez climb aboard as well for the debut. And I kept going back to the number three horse that we both have in third, and that's Tranquilina. Now in uh, Lisa Lewis's barn, this daughter of Liam's map makes her local debut after back-to-back -back fourth place finishes against Maiden Special Weight Competition going a mile on the Tampa turf. I went back. This horse was in the Christophe Clement barn. And, and, you know, if you play the percentages, Christophe, if he keeps him up at Tampa, he doesn't think maybe they can handle uh, the championship meet down here during the winter. I just thought this horse went fine in those two races. And I really like the work that Lisa Lewis does. She doesn't sell a lot of horses, but all the horses look and run well. Yeah, and when you start looking at the horses that have raced, I like that this one has gone the mile, whereas if you look at other horses like the filly on the rail, she's only gone five furlongs. She looked a little tired in there. And out of the Tampa races, at least she faced made in special weight competition in both of them. And she fared okay. I do think she also had some excuses. She did have traffic in the one race. So she's had time to regroup. You mentioned a new connection. So they've been knocking at getting that win here at the spring summer meet. They're four for six in the money. But it was interesting to also note that Lisa Lewis doesn't get a lot of trainer kind of switch horses. But when she does, they, they pay a nice. A nice payout, that's for sure. Well, that's how we see the first four. We'll take the short break. We'll come back, and the Rainbow Six will kick off in race number five on Memorial Day. Welcome back to Ghoststream today. Well, welcome back, Ron and Ashley. I'll even, um, well, um, you know, welcome myself back in here. <laughs> Happy Memorial Day. A little tongue tied there. I, I, you're not supposed to welcome yourself back. That's what happened in that spot. But you know me. You never know what I'm quite going to say. All I can say is my <laughs> Rainbow Six. It's $43.20. Let me get out of the hole I dug myself into right now. Three deep in here. I, I think that 
Fuego Caliente, who I have in second, but I, I like Thorne a little bit, and they also use Chow in there. Too deep in race number six with Malibu Max and Nacho Papa. And then in race number seven today, too deep again with Life Fury, Never Stop Dreaming. Got some coverage in the eight. I think that's wide open. Our stakes race today is the Golden Glades. I like Chuck Willis's chance along with Renaissance Frolic. And the last guy, the long shot today, the number four, Barnegat Light. 15 to 1 on the morning line, being a son of Summerfront by Warfront. Tell you about that horse a little later on. 43 20 for me. And uh, a couple of days ago, they got the Rainbow Six for 400000 And they were knocking on the door yesterday. They didn't get it. So that's why we have the $150,000 jackpot guarantee today. Yeah, looking at your ticket, I think the stakes race were kind of on the same page with the top two in there. I thought maybe in the exotics there were different directions to go. But another thing that were um, a common theme for us is race 10. Again, I feel like I handicapped a different race. <laughs> I only have the seven in agreement with you, but always looking forward to that long shot. Hopefully you'll be able to get that one home. Yeah, we'll see what happens. I, I want to see it. you started this uh, fifth race this afternoon. I, I did go with the number eight, Thorn. I don't know if you went to the inside. Oh, you went a little further down with the number four. I'm liking this, and that's Tellington, I believe. I took a stance here. I started looking at the field, and it came down to three horses for me, really, the one, uh, four, and the eight. And I decided to go with the four, Tellington, because he hasn't done anything wrong yet. I thought on debut it was a huge performance. I mean, he went off at 34 to 1, so he shocked everyone, but he basically circled the field from almost dead last early on to get up. And last time out on, at the mile on the slight cutback, he sat a little bit closer to the pace, and again, he circled the field and got up. So um, he likes these photo finishes, but he hasn't done anything wrong. He's joining a barn that wins at 25% off the claim. So I went with this horse hoping that he goes off closer to 7-2. to two. Well, you know, telling thing, my Sappy Joseph, the junior, is the trainer you're alluding to, and uh, he saw the same thing that you saw, that let me jump in and grab this horse. He's done nothing wrong. So I can understand having that horse in your ticket. I, I did go with the horse you have in second on top, and that's Eighth Thorn, who's stretching out slightly to the mile after prompting the pace and weakening to finish third. It was, again, similar quality going seven and a half uh, furlongs, about seven and a half. Not much difference between the about seven and a half and the mile. Son of Spites, the breaks from the outside. He's got the speed, and he's got the jockey, Sammy Camacho, needed to use that outside slot, I think, to his advantage. So it's sort of like a tactical speed play for me with the number eight thorn. When you look at his races in 2021, I think he only had one, as you would call in air quotes, poor performance, <laughs> and that was three starts back. But the winner, yes, this time is a force to be reckoned with. I think won five in a row so far in the career, a son of this, not this time. So it was tough competition on March 20th. And since then, he's had two back-to-back -back third place finishes. I thought last time out, he just seemed to get a little tired late. But his numbers, I mean, they're pretty strong here. And he's another one. I think horse, you know, people might play the horse on the rail a little bit more. So I liked Thorne as well. This is a horse that I'd used in that uh, early pick five. Yeah, alluding to that horse on the rail, the number one, Fuego Caliente. It's a half-brother to a multiple stakes winner called La Verdad. Uh, breaks from the rail, rallied uh, late when finishing second. Where? In front of Thorne last time out. It sets up another one of those clashes between speed and stalker. I'm always going to lean towards the speed side when, when I see, uh, you know, the way this turf course has been playing basically not every day, but a lot through the summer campaign. So Fuego Caliente, am I leaving him off the ticket? No, just like you did. I thought it was a logical one. And, and, and you know, he, he just sits up, and you know, I think he could sit a nice trip, especially if Thorne, and you would think, is going to be challenged on the front end. Yeah, you have to think Thorne's also just going to go from what we've seen with that outside post position and go towards the front. I think my concern with Fuego Caliente is I agree. I think he should get a good trip, but now he's breaking from the rail, and he doesn't have a lot of early foot, so it'll be interesting to see what position he gets himself in early. Two starts back, he had the lead late, and he surrendered to Uncle Fun, who we talk about once a week here. A really nice <laughs> horse here on the turf, and then last time out, I thought it was a good performance as well. So the last two I've really liked for him, and they've both been at this level. And you know the old adage of the longer price of the uncoupled <laughs> entry. Number six, Chow, is stretching out to the mile, hit the gate at the start, and failed to get on track when finishing six behind uh, both Thorne and F Fuego Caliente. But it's Safi Joseph Jr., and this is where Edgar is riding. Yeah, this is one that Edgar looks. I don't know if there was a choice or how it all worked mm -hmm. here, but when you look at the the claim race where this one was claimed out of for thirty five thousand, I liked the late move that this one made. Was favored in there, but still made up some steady ground late. The last two, he, he went off as the favorite two starts back and disappointed and disappointed a bit last time out. So I'm um, not sure, you know, where to use him other than underneath. And I think his local record kind of speaks maybe just to use him for third in here or a little further down. 
Let's go to race number six. About uh, well, it is one mile claimer, three year olds, and up twelve thousand five hundred dollars. No scratches in the race, and you and I both went with uh, Malibu Max. I was in, uh, interested to see how you were going to use Resident. We'll talk about that horse in a moment. But Malibu Max, five for nine in the money at the distance, stretches out first start since posting those back to back sprint victories against Tougher before going to the sidelines back in mid March. Safi Joseph Jr. once again. Doesn't seem like the time off really faces this now eight-year-old. I mean, when you look at him last year, 2020, he raced in the winter. Then we didn't see him until May. He wins with a big a big buyer speed figure. Then they give him a couple more months off. He wins again. Um, I love the trips that he gets to. I love that he sits just off the pace. He never lets the pace setter get too far in front of him. And I think that makes him probably, in my opinion, the horse to beat. Just I think he's going to get a good trip. Well, number six resident, uh, uh, just stepping up the competition. We're going to go back and show you this horse's last race. Boy, Boy, this horse just turned on the afterburners when Jerome Claire to defeat those 6,250 claimers by five widening lengths. Uh, Peter Walder has Chantal in the saddle. They hooked up for a win in yesterday's last race. And here you just see this horse. And the reason I want to show you this window dressing, what did we get this afternoon? I didn't know. You had it second. I had it third. I was honestly torn between the horse that you used for a second. I think you could flip-flop them and make the case. I mean, Resident showed some early foot last time out and went to the front. If you kind of look down the page, two out of the last uh, three wins, they've been on front-end fashion. So I have to think this gelding's going to be involved early. I liked last time out, too. He was coming out of some six-and-a-half for long races. The stretch out to a mile, he showed an improved performance. But you already mentioned it. That was at 62.50. Now he's jumping up. It's going to be a little bit tougher than he saw last time out. And then number five, Nacho Papa, a reclaim by Carl. Carlos David stretches out to eight after using his speed to defeat eight thousand dollar daily claim is going seven uh, it's new connections and it's old connections they're both because he's had this horse in the past and he's keeping jose morelos in the saddle today and you know carlos david he's jumped back in i think a horse that you have to give another look to yeah you always talk about the reclaim that's one of your favorite <laughs> yeah. angles and I, I think it's it speaks a lot about nacho papa i mean if the connections want him again they're they went in for him this time and they claimed him again last time out for eight thousand looking at those last two the win last time out was nice the runner right up came back to win uh next time out and so did the third place finisher it was a pretty productive event and then two starts back against what i would say was tougher than today you finished a good third so another one that i thought you had to use somewhere in the top three well let's go to race number seven one mile on the turf starter allowance uh, three-year-olds and up starter for 16 or less uh, scratch the main track only number five and this is where by the way that last race is where the late pick five starts and this is where a late pick four is going to start and let's see your ticket yeah, $24 plate today. I went too deep in here. Used the number three, Never Stop Dreaming, as well as the number eight, Light Fairy, two to one on the morning line. Race eight, I also go too deep. I use Vinnie Van Gogh, who's been a hot commodity here in <laughs> South Florida. Gets claimed almost every single start, as well as the number five, Rough Entry. Then I spread in the stake. I think you only went too deep in here. You yeah. used Renaissance Frolic, as well as the number eight, Chuck Willis. But I liked a couple other horses that I think Noble Indy might be a sleeper. And then Val Me Now is also a price horse at 10 to one morning line. And then I spread for some coverage in the nightcap. I used three horses in here. We agree on the number seven, Uncle Jammo, but I used two others in here. The number two, Everesting, and the three, seven channel. So 24 bucks. I had to use steak and cheese just because of the name in that last race. Let's go to the seventh race. We're in agreement with the uh, you know the first couple in your late pick five. I started it off with Light Fury's dropping a notch on the competition scale. Set the pace, got caught late when finishing third was beaten uh, against those 20 starter allowance runners for Ronnie Spatz. Edwin Gonzalez going to handle the outside draw this afternoon. We thought this one was the logical choice, along with your top pick, the three, never stop dreaming. Light Fairy's done basically nothing wrong here on the turf course. Has that one off the board finish. It was two starts back, but I thought he had some troubled, uh, a troubled trip in there as well. So kind of draw a line through that. I mean, what do you take away? He's been so consistent <laughs> here, and he's always there. He can sit off the pace, which is interesting. When he won uh, three, uh, two wins ago, that was back in December, he sat off the pace, or he can go to the front. So a lot of options for him. And then you mentioned I go to the three and never stop dreaming. I, I just thought looking at the last couple races, this is another one, a very similar performer here locally. I just like those last three turf efforts, it seems like this horse has really stepped up from those dirt uh, tries that we saw before that. So I thought he'd he maybe be a little bit better of a price. So I used him on top. Well, we've been car carrying uh, members of the Hector Berrios uh, <laughs> fan club over the last couple of days. He's been winning a couple of races, and that is uh, who will be the board, the number three, and never stopped uh, dreaming. Young Flint, 
is stepping up the competition today, posted his second consecutive turf victory. He sort of circled the field. He defeated those two lifetime claimers, going to be about seven and a half. Uh, son of Flincher has turned his fortunes around. Boy, they moved him to the turf. They added to the blinkers, and he seems to have uh, found a new career. He has, and I like horses when they break the maiden, they come back to win next time out, facing winners for the first time. I think it bodes well for them. And you mentioned he kind of circles the field. He's going to probably sit from off the pace. Edgar Zayas is staying aboard, also a positive sign. I just thought this was going to be a tougher task than he faced last time out, and the other two that we talked about, they're a little bit more accomplished so far in their careers. Well, let's go to race number eight, five and one half furlongs, allowance optional claim of state bred three-year-olds, and they'll put the optional claiming price $12,500. Did have a scratch in here of the number six, so we have a field of six, and that was one of the, I think, two or three scratches on the whole card. And you're absolutely about right about Vinny Van Gogh. He probably knows his way around the backside better than anybody. He's been in everybody's barn at least once, it seems, and uh, reclaimed by Victor Barboza Jr. Turns back to five and a half furlongs today, set a pressured pace. Finished second, was beating the neck against this, going three quarters. Edgar Zayas rides. This is when you're looking down and you say a hard-knocking five-year-old. Vinnie Van Gogh's picture is there. All seven of his <laughs> career wins, they've come locally. You mentioned rejoins the Victor Barboza Jr. Barn. This is at least for the third time. <laughs> and I can only see 12 <laughs> run lines. At least three times. Peter Walters had the horse twice. I like that he's exper you know, accomplished at the distance as well. Two of his wins have come at this five-and-a-half furlong distance. And last time out going slightly longer, he was just so game throughout. He just got denied by spear gun in the end. So, I mean, what's there to say? It's kind of his past performances speak everything that we really need to show. And he's just been so good here that I think he's probably Probably the toughest horse in the competition, I, you know, in this field. I think the next one's probably rough entry, which you agree with. Yeah, moves to the Rohan Crichton bar, and after the claim, steps up the competition. Was impressive drawing clear uh, to defeat those 22 lifetime claimers. Going sick, but run that race, I think, by like six lengths, if I remember correctly. Yeah, big, big win from him last time out, and was claimed out of there, joins the new barn, as you mentioned. And, and before that, he had two back-to-back -back efforts at the five-and-a-half for long distance, and he finished second in both of them. Uh, last time out, he was able to show that speed and carry himself, but sometimes he gets a little bit tired in the end. A horse I just wanted to touch on briefly is the seven lost the legend is making his first start since Jordan Clear defeated the maiden special weight runners going seven furlongs. It was back at Gulfstream Park West on that sealed sloppy track, but I like the connections. I like the fact that this horse gets Lasix, MSCL, Jaramillo uh, returning on the son of Vancouver. Maybe for a horse for underneath, I think, yeah, well, he's actually third choice on the board. I didn't know what to do with him. I thought about using him. I think the only thing that deterred me was I looked at the long layoff of over six months. The barn, it's not their best angle. I'm actually curious. I'll probably do it once they get off air. I'm curious to see how Ralph Nix does with the long layoff with horses that won last time out. I mean, that might be something to kind of look into, but pretty nice maiden win. That was at Gulfstream Park West over the slot, but this horse got to the front and it was over from the gate, basically. Well, let's go to our ninth and feature race on Memorial Day. One mile on the turf, three-year-olds and up. It's the $70,000 the Golden Glades in the Golden Glades Expressway with all those roads get like this. Uh, I'm not a fan, but I'm a fan of this race for sure this afternoon. And you might be the right, you might have found the right angle by going four deep in here because it's not as easy it seems. But I want to go back and show you two horses in an air race and that's Chuck Willis along with Blameless in here. And I just thought this was interesting. I'm going to see Chuck Willis, who is the number uh, seven horse, sort of blowing the turn there, which opens up the rail for the number two Blameless. So you go, oh my goodness, this horse, you know, we're going to blow but now he re-rallies and comes back and is able to win again. I thought that was a very interesting move by Chuck Willis. And, and so blameless in second, but Chuck Willis uh, on top of my ticket from our Cassie Miguel Vasquez uh, going for two in a row. Boy, this horse has been in good form going for his fourth consecutive victory. Two wins coming on the Tapeta surface up at Woodbine. When you look at the Tapeta races, I mean, he went to the front and he was just kind of the, the dominant horse in those races. But I love that you showed that replay because to get past like that and to have a late punch again, you don't really see that too often. I mean, with classier horses, you do, and he clearly is a classy horse now getting into this stakes race, and it's going to be his first stakes race since coming over here from Great Britain, but he's been consistent in his career. He's a four-time winner. He's lightly raced as a five-year-old, and 
You mentioned it. The big thing is, can he keep the win streak going? Well, we'll see. But I can understand to also having the number two renaissance frolic on top, who was given some time off, just really displayed a touch of class when he ran second in that uh, the grade three Appleton. That's why I put him on top, yeah. was that performance solidified it for me. When you look at the grade three race, Gray's Fable went to the front, was very quick and tough to catch in there for kind of uh, where he was coming from out of that. It was a huge performance, and he was just second best. But it was great at stakes competition, so he's had some time off to regroup. He doesn't seem to be necessarily the flashiest of workers, but I think I'm not worried about his workouts. I've seen what he's been able to do at the racetrack. He's won three races here locally on the turf, so I gave him the slight edge. Well, tell me about the number seven, Val Me Now, who I used uh, a little further. I didn't use on my ticket. I was thinking I had him in fourth, but I didn't. So what do you like? I like that he's won two out of his last three. 2021, he had a lot of time off, and to see him come back and now kind of racing in career best buyer numbers, that stood out to me. We didn't see him from July 2019 all the way to March 2021. Two starts back, I think he had issues. He did not get a good break like he usually has had. He's been very sharp out of the gate, and I thought he'd be a big part of the pace scenario. He's six for nine in terms of wins here. Now, the concern is I think he's also going to get pressure today, and he's going to get some class tests from his other couple races, but I thought he could at least maybe hang around for a share. Yeah, and trained by Eddie Pleasa Jr. His horse has been running exceptionally well over the last few days, so Eddie uh, a good friend, and uh, we'll see that horse runs a good angle with that horse. I sort of went to one, me and Mr. C in third, who's going to depart from the rail. He had a three race win streak on the Tampa turf, and when he broke slowly, finished third behind a hard knocking multiple a local winner, turf winner, that's Monforte going a mile, so just keying off Monforte, and this one that he broke slowly, Mike Maker, Christian Torres in the saddle. Maybe this one uh, at 4 to 1 in the morning line can grab a share. When you look down at his past performances, he's only four years old, but he's tried some stakes competition that's tougher than he's going to face today. He tried it a graded stake all the way back in 2020. He didn't fare well, but you mentioned it. He might get a good trip as well. We talked about some horses. I talked about a horse with early foot, some that stock. I think he's going to close from off the pace, so it'll be interesting to see how the early fraction set up for him. Well, you know, you used four on your ticket, so let's talk about Noble Indy. <laughs> I just thought this horse was sneaky. I know last time out, me and Mr. C, the horse that you like, beat him, and so did over the channel. But he had some issues in the gate. He didn't seem himself. And before that, he had two solid races. I thought he was another one. He's going to sit from off the pace. But when you start looking at some of his races, a lot of these horses have beat him. But I just thought, you know, this is Safi Joseph. When you look at the horses that he sends out, I can't leave him off my ticket. You know, uh, the rider has actually, I think, been doing pretty well lately. And this horse has done well since coming here to Gulfstream Park. So instead of going three deep, I said it's only a $24 ticket. I'm going to toss one more in. Yeah, maybe we should have gone five deep. I don't know. <laughs> but it's a good ticket. It's only 24 bucks, and you're right. You, as we talk about that race, you can just see how many different ways you could go in there. We're going to close out the uh, Memorial Day weekend and our last race of the week, which will happen later on today. A mile on the turf. Maiden claim is three and up $50,000. I'll start it off with my long shot in here for Barnegat Light, who's the son of Summer Front by Warfront, who ran, I thought, a respectable fourth when going a mile against special weight competition. That was during his freshman campaign. Returns from the layoff, gets Lasix, and he's firing bullets on the Palm Meadows turf. And I just thought that this maybe can spring the upset in here at the $50,000 level. If you look at the jockey and trainer, of course, Hall of Famer Edgar Prado and Timmy Ham, they win races at like about a 27% clip. It's not a big sampling. So putting that all together, I thought maybe I can get a little bit of a price of 15 to 1. And we'll see how this, uh, this plays out in the nightcap. You mentioned the debut on the, the turf, but even the race on the slop, when you're not planning to race on the main track <laughs> and now it's a sloppy main track, it's a lot for a horse to kind of face. And this horse got a great trip from Victor LeBron sitting off the pace and finished second. Just was second best. The winner was the pace setter in there and was able to win. So I think this is a really great live long shot. And you mentioned the numbers of the, the jockey and the trainer. Just now, made in special weight to made in claiming level. That's 18% that, that Tim Ham wins at. So, have to like what you see on paper. And you did go with the number two horse. I'm a little further down on my ticker, Everesting. So, I, I thought that was a logical contender in there, but I got enamored with my long shot. Hey, you got to take a stance here. I, this is another numbers game for me. I mean, the horse has tried the turf twice in the career. The dirt was uh, the first start of 2021 off the break, I should say, did make the debut. But when you look at the debut, faced Annex, who won a couple stakes races here during the championship meet. I didn't like the race last time out. When you see a horse favored like that, he really didn't have anything to, to show. He didn't have to swing out at one point, but I would have liked to seen more. My big thing here now is blinkers on and then Safi from Maiden Special Weight to Maiden Claiming. 
46%. That's just hard to ignore. So then it was the numbers. I'm a stats girl. I got to go with what I see on paper. Safi Joseph Jr. has got a chance to win a bunch of races today <laughs> like he does every day. I thought, besides my long shot and everything else, I thought the horse originally to beat was the number seven, Uncle Jamo, who's uh, turning back to the mile. He dueled for the lead. He got beat a nose against 50 maidens, going a mile in the 16th for Dave Forks, Jose Morello's the top. Uh, I, I think the one to fear in the nightcap, I think if this horse runs his race, going to be very tough this afternoon. I mean, that was a huge performance at 17-1, to 1, and, and you see a horse like that who wasn't taking respect, but he went off at those odds because he hadn't raced in over two years. <laughs> that is so hard to do. To, so to see him kind of transform, making his five-year-old debut, I mean, his pedigree is beautiful. He was a pricey purchase back in the day. Now I'm just wondering, now second time out, what are we going to see? Did it take something away from him, or did or could he move up? And I have a feeling he might be able to improve. I happened to walk back to my office with David Forks after that race and just was just shaking his head. I mean, that was a slight yeah. nose in there. Uh, you knew I was going to use steak and cheese somewhere on my ticket. You used it a little further down. This one is certainly eligible to show more after closing to finish fourth behind the horse we were just talking about, Uncle Jamo, in his career debut, going eight and a half furlongs for Mr. Mike Maker, uh, one of the greatest turf trainers in the world, never mind just here in South Florida. So Edwin can Gonzalez in the saddle. I loved this horse last time out. I touted him. I used him a little further. I still think the, the race last time out was good. I wanted to see a little bit more. We already know I get bitter when horses I use don't perform <laughs> as expected. But I, I used him a little further, too, just because Uncle Jamo was just that close to winning that race and was able to beat him. But Edwin Gonzalez is staying aboard. I lot to like. The turf race, certainly the light bulb went on for this three-year-old gelding. So I, I understand using him. I just went to the three in here, seven channels. We talked about Lisa Lewis, the work she does. So I decided to use that one instead. Well, that is how we see the 10 race cards. So let's quickly go to our lightning round. And, you know, we've got a couple of things going on on the sister tracks uh, uh, in the lightning round. One of them is Pimlico. They have a eight. $833,000 plus carryover in their Rainbow Six. There it is, $833,000. That is races three, two, eight. Uh, they really got it punched up when they bet a lot of money in on um, Preakness Day, and no one's hit it since then, so you got a chance to take it down. It's 20 cents, just like here. I have to look at it with the holiday <laughs> card. I get, there's a lot of tracks in the, the DRF today. I got the paper copy right here on the desk. So I got to look at it. And I know I'm sure you're going to look at it. You might have to dig up your coffee cans out of your yard to play an extra ticket. Yeah, after the last couple of days, I'm going to have to maybe dig a coffee can up in somebody else's yard. <laughs> uh, we had a really good race yesterday, a feature race at the Biscayne Landing. And uh, it, it was a good performance. And, uh, you know, Lagerta was so game winning this race. Couldn't we just go back and revisit the. And you see Lagerta being the number one just ducking down on the inside, uh, talking about, I thought Safi saw Sav was going to win it in here, and it just, uh, Lagerta was so game on the inside uh, to keep going on, holds off the four horse, choose joy. Of course, I had the exact flip-flop. They ran one, two, two, one, and now they ran one, two this time, so yep. Uh, yep. Uh, they're very competitive when they see each other. Yeah, they were able to flip the rivalry after the last race, so I thought that was a great race. That When you see a blanket finish like that, that's what we want to see in horse racing, but I always like when there's a little bit of a rivalry, so hopefully we'll see them again again sometime this summer, square off. Well, let's go all the way out to the West Coast, but they got a great day of racing at Santa Anita today. And one of those races they're off in race number seven is a win in your in, and it's the grade one the Shoemaker Mile at Santa Anita. So uh, uh, we'll see how that plays out today. Good field of seven runners in that, in that performance. And if they win, you get a, a date into the Breeders' Cup of Dirt Mile. I've been looking at this. You mentioned it's seven horses. I've been looking at the field. It is a great race. I think there's some horses in there that might be able to offer a little bit more value than the two horses that are favored on the morning line. I'm a big fan of Say the Word, so I like the price of four to one morning line. So I'm going to take a look at the card at Santa Anita because they have some big stakes ahead today. Yeah, so we got racing on the East Coast, West Coast, and Sewer down here in South Florida. So uh, the Stronic Group is, has certainly covered all bases today on Memorial Day. Uh, good luck with all your selections throughout the afternoon. Ashley and I'll be back in a couple of moments. And they're off! Second in the two path. Round off her inside. Race. And a quarter of a mile to go, and he sits on top! Last of the 12. Roll into the backstretch. 